pleased to have Professor Talia Toro from Slack, right up the road, uh, to give the talk today. It's going to be a second talk on dark matter. We had one from Louis Trigari, and he was talking about what might be called near field cosmology and using astronomical arguments to sort of learn about the mystery of dark matter. Uh, uh, today's talk is going to be on. Uh, not going out into the galaxy, but from looking at dark matter underneath uh, Professor Toro's nose, I believe, is the, is the location. And that was the original title, but that's slightly evolved into uh, exploring the dark sector and the surprising opportunities at familiar mass scale. So this is an experimental approach, and again, one of the great mysteries of our time. Uh, Toro uh, was uh, undergraduate, I think, at MIT, and then went to Harvard, where she worked with Nima Akhani Havad. Uh, she um, worked at Stanford uh, in Savas Demopoulos' group and uh, also at Slack. They went to the Perimeter Institute and then came back to Stanford where she'd been a professor at Slack by I think three years, almost three years. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Talia Taro giving her talk on our matter. All right, so apologies, I was talking to Shaman instead of getting my microphones on. Hold on just a second. Um. <coughs> All right, so hopefully you can hear me okay now. Um, so this is a talk about the quest to understand, I changed the title from searching for the dark sector to exploring the dark sector because we know there is one. Uh, this is about the quest to understand what the dark matter actually is at a microscopic level and what it teaches us about the laws of nature with a focus on the possibilities where the dark matter mass is close to the familiar mass scale of electrons and protons. So this is both under our noses in the usual figurative sense and in a literal sense, this mass range for dark matter corresponds to roughly one dark matter particle at any given time being in that little area under your nose. Um, so dark matter is a problem that ties together astronomy and particle physics. So I think it's appropriate to start from the night sky. Now, if you're ever trying to figure out whether somebody's a particle physicist or not, Ask them what they think of the night sky. Isn't it beautiful tonight? Or isn't it such a shame that we can't see anything because it's full of smoke? Well, the particle physicist will say, oh, it's all the same to me. Because as different as it is when we look at a star, a distant galaxy, a supernova, as important as these differences are, really, they're all governed by the same laws of physics that our pedestrian everyday life is governed by two, and our subatomic particle searches and everything else. So this universality of physical law is both remarkable and remarkably powerful in letting us understand the universe around us. And actually, I think that there's an even more dramatic side of that that has emerged over the last half century or so, which is that these laws have a common underlying structure. And I think a great example of that is in very physically different forces, the strong and weak forces that are relevant only inside of nuclei at very short distances. Um, strong force binds the protons and neutrons in a nucleus together. The weak force leads to radioactive beta decays. Both of these play an important role in the fusion processes that power our sun. And they look physically extremely different from electromagnetic forces. And yet, at a fundamental mathematical level, in terms of their underlying physical interaction structure, they are very similar to one another and to the long-range electromagnetic force. There's also a lot of patterns and symmetries in the types of matter. Electrons are related by symmetry to the neutrino, even though the electron is one of the most you know, eager to interact particles that we have, especially at high energies in the neutrino, the shyest particle we have. Um, and all of the particles that make up the that make up atoms, up and down quarks and electrons, are related by symmetries to heavier cosms that have exactly the same interaction structure and differ only in mass. So there's a great deal of universality in our understanding of physical laws, 
both across space and time and different life scales and also in their fundamental structure. And as we have come to understand that universality, the laws have become much more predictive, letting us understand, for example, the dynamics inside of a supernova as a large old star is collapsing in on itself, letting us predict decades before its discovery that there should be, for the consistency of our theory of subatomic particles, a Higgs boson that was then found the OHC. And yet, when we look back up at the sky with even greater precision, there's a problem. All the successes of universality at small scale start failing. This picture doesn't work when we start trying to assess whether the matter we see in the universe can explain its total mass. So we can look at this in many different eras, many different, uh, many different length scales. And of course, I'm a particle physicist, they're all the same to me, so this isn't my work, this is the work of generations and generations of astronomers and astrophysicists before me that have seen in the speed of rotation of stars in the galaxy, or in the lensing of one galaxy by another galaxy, in the collisions of two galaxy clusters, and in the power spectrum of the early universe, evidence that there is far more mass in the universe than what we can actually see made of the subatomic constituents that we understand so well, whose interactions we understand so well and can apply everywhere. So the overwhelming majority of our universe is made of something that doesn't fit into this picture. And we often look at this pie chart, classifying what's all the energy density in the universe. There's about 4% due to the standard model matter that we understand. And then the rest we can only classify by its equation of state. There's a negative pressure component, there's a pressureless component. Okay, if I told you there was a liquid component and a solid component of the Earth, and I could tell you their mass fractions, but I couldn't tell you that some of the liquid was ocean and some of it was magma, you probably wouldn't be very impressed. Um, but this is where we're at, and for weighing the cosmos, which we don't have direct access to, it's pretty good. Now, it's tempting to focus our attention on you know, the big gorilla in the room, the large green region of this pie chart. Um, it's certainly an interesting problem. Where does this dark energy, negative pressure component of the universe come from? Um, but at least for my purposes today, it's less interesting because there's no need to add new matter or dynamics to explain it. It could just be a new parameter in our description of nature that we already have. On the other hand, this pressureless component has to be pretty radical. It really needs new kinds of stuff that is not encompassed by our standard model theory. So this is a sharp hint that the picture we have of the microscopic nature of matter, of everything in the universe, is incomplete. We don't know what it's made of, and to quote Vera Rubin, we've seen that it's more mysterious as the universe is more mysterious and more complex than we had imagined. Still more mysteries of the universe remain hidden, and of course these mysteries come from our preliminary understanding, but a complete understanding of what it is. So what can we say with confidence about the dark matter? Well, we know that it's old. We know that already 400,000 years after the Big Bang, there's a cosmic microwave background, and in that cosmic microwave background, there is an imprint of dark matter. So we know that it was made during the Big Bang or even before the Big Bang in order to have left an imprint there. It was made before the first stars formed, long before the first stars formed. We also know that in the early days of structure formation, it wasn't moving very fast. And that's necessary in order to make sure that dark matter could form the small scale cosmological structures that we observe. Now, those are the, the only two sort of positive things I can think of to definitively say about dark matter. We all know some things about what it can't be, and probably the most zero order ones are that it can't have strong interactions, it can't have electromagnetic strength interactions with familiar matter, um, because this is at odds both with observations, <coughs> well, with both the cosmological behavior of dark matter and, the, uh, and direct observations, and even weak interactions are significantly constrained by the data for a wide range of masses. Now this leaves a lot of room for speculation as to what dark matter could be. With a mass range going all the way in units of the proton mass, from 10 to the minus 30 to about 10 to the 60, give or take a few orders of magnitude. And the lowest part of this mass range, the dark matter, is essentially wave-like, 
because we shouldn't talk about them as particles anymore. There's a large number density in any unit of phase space. And the highest mass range, they actually can't be fundamental particles. They're too heavy. They're heavier than we think the largest fundamental particles can be at the Planck scale. And so they have to be some kind of composite, either a blob of a lighter exotic matter particle or a primordial black hole that was created through some exotic processes in the early universe. Still a sign of fundamental physics beyond the standard model, but not necessarily, you know, the dark matter is not a one-to-one -one mapping with the constituents, or with the new particle interaction, the particle constituents that we think about. In between, there's a 10 to the 26 or so range of masses where dark matter really is new particle light. Okay, 90 orders of magnitude. Where do we look first? Well, Occam gave us an idea. Study the simplest theories first. There's a little bit of caution about this. If you've ever been to the Razor Isle at CVS or Target, you know that there's this unbelievable plethora of different razors, each of which claims to be the best. <laughs> so similarly here, which ones are the simplest theories? Are the simplest theories the ones that look the most standard model-like in their fundamental mechanisms? Are they the ones with the fewest parameters? Are they the ones with the most new particles, the fewest new particles? And by that, do you mean the fewest fundamental degrees of freedom or the fewest detectable degrees of freedom? Do you want to, do you care about robustness to unknown physics at high energies, about the simplicity of cosmology? These are all great, interesting, compelling features for a dark matter candidate to have. But they're often in conflict with each other. And if you ask, does the standard model pass this litmus test for flying colors, the answer, honestly, is usually no. So if there's one takeaway that I want to emphasize about Occam's razor, it's that it's really dangerous to put too much trust in it. And we have to be careful. So OK. I nonetheless started with this as a sort of organizing principle. I think a pragmatic interpretation of it that, uh, that I can stand by is that you certainly want to be guided by looking for tractable and accessible parameter spaces. Trying to divide these possibilities into as many as possible and isolate the places where you can really gain some concrete understanding by exploring them comprehensively and deeply. And our best path to understanding dark matter is by testing all of these accessible possibilities and by thinking also about, about possibilities that are interesting but not accessible and making them accessible. That still leaves a broad palette of possible dark matter models to consider. Beyond that, you have to go to individual taste. And my own personal biases, at least recently, have been thinking about dark matter models that extend the structure and mass scales of the, of the standard model in a relatively conservative way. That is to say, really similar structures, similar mass scales. How well do these theories work? How do we look for them? And also, looking, focusing on theories that have a really central and standard cosmological origin and are robust to the big uncertainties we have about the really early moments of the early universe. Um, so these are, not, uh, these are not provably correct statements. But what I think makes them exciting is that it's actually possible to take these statements and rule them out experiment, rule, rule them out together experimentally. So I want to start by just introducing this framework, and I started from and starting from this, this viewpoint of a simple predictive cosmological history. So let's think about a new particle, call it chi, it's our dark matter candidate, that has some kind of interaction with ordinary matter in a standard cosmology. If that interaction is of some respectable strength. The dark matter particles annihilating are going to annihilate in standard model particles and vice versa, and that annihilation both ways is going to maintain a thermal and chemical equilibrium. So initially, at temperatures much larger than the dark matter particle mass, you have comparable densities, say, of dark matter and electrons or dark matter and photons. As the universe cools to temperatures below the dark matter mass, the number density of dark matter starts depleting exponentially because you maintain this chemical equilibrium. But now, the Maxwell-Boltzmann abundance of dark matter particles becomes suppressed by their mass. 
So as the density falls, that means the rate for two dark matter particles finding each other is falling steeply. And remember, this is an exponential drop-off. So you reach a point where that interaction slump rate becomes slower than the cooling rate of the universe, slower than the Hubble expansion rate. And so the density of dark matter per co-moving volume, per part of the universe that's expanding, is going to be fixed because the dark matter particles stop finding each other, stop annihilating. That's the number you end up with. And the resulting density then depends essentially only on the annihilation cross-section, weakly on the dark matter mass, but importantly not at all on the high temperature initial condition. You could have had a lot of dark matter from inflation, you could have had very little dark matter from inflation. That all gets washed out by the equilibration with ordinary matter at high, high temperatures. And in fact, we've measured the dark matter density, so you can predict the cross-section. Again, factors a few dependence on the dark matter mass that I'm suppressing, suppressing here. That annihilation cross-section should be about 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second. Now, what does that number mean? Well, one reason to be excited about that is that you can put in some sort of interesting mass scales for weak scale physics. This is the so-called miracle. Imagine that there's a new physics associated with the origin of the electroweak scale, the electroweak symmetry breaking, say around the TEB, and that the interaction strength is comparable to the weak interactions. And just do dimensional analysis of those two scales, you get a cross-section that's in the right ballpark, so it's 3 to the minus 26 centimeters per second. So that's a very compelling possibility. It's one that's actually been quite well explored at this point. But, of course, that dimensional analysis I showed you had a number in the numerator and a number in the, in the denominator, and you can change them both. We can talk about higher masses with a lot stronger couplings, lower masses with weaker couplings, and these are all viable. So that gives you, if you say, well, 3 tenths to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second is just a number, maybe that coincidence with the weak scale was just a coincidence. This gives you a family of interactions of dark matter at different mass scales that are all viable. You can't go over that whole 90 orders of magnitude anymore, though, or even close. A little bit higher, a few orders of magnitude higher than the Higgs mass, you end up with dark matter that no matter how strongly coupled it is, at any theoretically consistent coupling, wouldn't interact enough. So there's an upper limit around 100 TeV, 10 to the 5 proton masses an upper, upper limit on how heavy the dark matter could be and realize this mechanism. And there's a lower limit. There's a sort of soft lower limit at the electron mass. If dark matter is lighter than the electron, it's just harder for it to annihilate into anything because the only, because models where it annihilates into neutrinos or photons have to be pretty complicated. And if you went even lighter than that, something like 20 keV, well, then you start running into these cold dark matter, these warm or hot dark matter constraints. And so that gives you, depending on how you count, something like an 8 or 9 order of magnitude window, down from 90, for this very simple mechanism of what the dark matter, how the dark matter could arise. And not only is it it's not any old 9 orders of magnitude, it's 9 orders of magnitude that are close to familiar mass scales. So the upper half of this mass scale range is what's viable for WIMPs for annihilation through weak interactions. But that whole lower part is viable for more general thermal models, too. Now, how can we look for that? Well, clearly the starting point should be that this whole paradigm for the origin of dark matter posited a particular strength of dark matter interaction, a particular particular strength of dark matter interaction cross-section. You can turn that around to motivate a, a cross-section for dark matter scattering of familiar matter, or for dark matter production by particles, by accelerated particles interacting with the nucleus, or particle, standard model particle antiparticle annihilations, a bunch of different processes. And in all cases, there's the same basic idea that the dark matter abundance tells us what the early universe interaction rate has been, should have been, and we can try to infer from that a predicted amount. Here, Obviously, these predictions vary depending on a couple of things. One thing that I'm not going to talk about very much 
is how those interaction rates, rates vary depending on what you're annihilating into. And that's really important for heavy wares. If you're annihilating into Ws, then the analogous process to see dark matter scattering is scattering off of a W, but the W decays, so you have to create a virtual W, and there's going to be a lot of extra suppression associated with that. When we focus on, when I move the focus later on to lighter dark matter, coupling to electrons is the relevant annihilation mechanism, is a very relevant example. Uh, but couplings to protons can be important too. So in the case of scattering, well, we have a halo of dark matter all around us, and you can look for dark matter particles scattering off of nuclei in a large detector. Um, this is a picture of the Lux experiment. It's one of many of the cutting-edge experiments looking for dark matter scattering off ordinary matter in, in a large, very clean, deep underground detector where there's not a lot of other scattering events going on. And this is the parameter space that's usually shown for dark matter direct detection with the mass, here this is in GeV, so going from about 1 to 10,000 GeV in mass, or 1 to 10,000 proton masses. And on interaction cross-section, and this is different from the annihilation cross-section, this is a scattering cross-section, um, higher interaction strengths at the top, lower interaction strengths at the bottom. And the numbers won't really matter for the purposes of this talk, uh, but there are a few interesting benchmarks associated with what you'd expect if the dark matter scatters through the Z, through the Higgs, or if it only couples to the charged weak bosons, the Ws, then you have to go through a loop involving two Ws in order to, produce, to, to see dark matter scattering, so that has a very low rate. Um, and we can see that there's been a push to make experiments bigger and bigger over time, which drives you to lower and lower rate sensitivity further and further down this plot. Um, and the next generation of experiments is really exploring the Swift paradigm very broadly. But the dark matter mass range that's motivated by, by thermal origin is, of course, much larger. The reason that most of these experiments have stopped at a few GeV, the, the theoretical reason, is that annihilation from, uh, from standard model forces, from WZs or Higgses, would be too small to lead to the observed abundance for any dark matter lighter than a few GeV. And so for many decades, the focus of dark matter searches was really on heavier dark matter, essentially for a theoretical bias region, reason. Now there's also an experimental reason that these pairs don't go further, which is that any detector has an energy threshold, and for dark matter below that energy threshold, for dark matter so that's lighter, it's too light to go to the left on the plot. The energy it deposits in the dark in the detector is very low, and that means that you can't actually see it. Um, but the motivation for pushing thresholds lower is really a recent development as people have come to to understand better certain sector dark matter models and gain more interest in them. So there's a lot of ideas on the table for low threshold direct detection experiments. Um, it's much easier to see light dark matter scattering if you look for it scattering off electrons or off light nuclei rather than off of really heavy nuclei like xenon. You know. And so that's a direction that people have been going. Where it turns out that you can make big inroads in new parameter space, an interesting parameter space, even with detectors that are, say, 1 to 100 gram scale as opposed to the multi-ton detectors that are, uh, that are the norm for the WIMP searches right now. Um, and these include a lot, of, a lot of semiconductor detectors with electron volt energy thresholds, as well as some new ideas being pursued for, uh, for detection of, for example, of recoils off, say, helium or, uh, or hydrogen. Um, and here, so here's the here's a parameter space for these new searches, looking focusing on the electron recoil case. Um, dark matter mass now in any V on the x-axis, so electron to proton mass is the range here and another cross-section variable on the y-axis. And what I've shown here are the predictions for that interaction rate for thermal dark matter for a couple of different cases of the spin and the interaction structure of the dark matter. So it could be an elastically scattering scalar, or it could be a scalar with a mass splitting and a mass off-diagonal interaction. And that makes about a 20, 15 to 20 order of magnitude uh, difference. In, uh, in the 
the interaction strength that you expect, going all the way from the top line to the third line down. Or it could be a fermion, and depending on whether it's a Majorana fermion or a direct fermion, it's a little bit of mass splitting, another large separation. So if we look at what these 100 gram detectors can do, on one hand, I think it's a really exciting triumph that these small detectors can access light thermal dark matter. And in fact, over the next couple of years, this 100 gram run of the sensation factor, which is funded, assuming they reach the background levels that they expect, is going to explore a lot of this elastic scalar dark matter possibility. On the other hand, there's also a lot of thermal dark matter possibilities that are simply many, many orders of magnitude beyond reach, 20 to 30 orders of magnitude beyond reach. And the reason for that is that the dark matter in the halo is very slow moving. And the interaction strengths at low velocities are suppressed either by kinematic factors or by the fact that you have to scatter through a loop. So this is really similar in origin to the spread and loop thing. Um, a little bit different in detail. Uh, but even though we have a sharp prediction for the interaction strength from thermal freeze-out, that doesn't necessarily translate into a sharp prediction for the cross-section. And the basic reason for that is that, we're, that direct detection probes dark matter interactions at momentum transfers that are non-relativistic, much smaller than the mass of the dark matter, while the Big Bang production is, is probing dark matter interactions at momenta comparable to the mass of the dark matter. In other words, the Big Bang production process, that's at velocity, dark matter relative velocities tenth of, of about a half to a third. And direct detection is at dark matter relative velocities of 10 to the minus 3 times the speed of light. Accelerated production, on the other hand, is accessing momentum transfers comparable to the mass of the dark matter or larger. And so this is actually very similar to Big Bang production. Well, what that means is that this 30 order of magnitude spread in the possible direct detection rates for thermal dark matter collapses into just a handful of order of magnitude spread for, uh, for accelerator production, because you're near the Big Bang kinematics. So a couple other things to note about this parameter space. The interaction strength that you need is small. I realize that the fuzz is also small, so I'm not sure if you can actually see it, but it's this dimensionless interaction strength, and this is a square of a coupling as at the level of about 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 15, depending on the mass of the dark matter. And it's a weaker interaction for lighter dark matter. The fact that it's small in all of these cases means this parameter space is actually allowed by existing data. Adding the interaction of this strength, an interaction of this strength of electrons with themselves does not pose any problem with experimental data, nor does adding an interaction of electrons with dark matter. The interactions that you need to probe to test this get weaker for lighter dark matter. So that's in a way an appealing trade-off because, well, probe weaker interactions, you're going to need higher statistics, more precision, but maybe that's easier to get when you don't need as much energy. And the interaction strengths, by the way, this isn't something I have time to go through in detail, but there's a very simple story. The interaction strengths that you'd expect if this new interaction is generated by quantum corrections, basically lead, quantum corrections lead to the coupling of some new force to ordinary matter, you would expect interaction strength right about in this range. So this is a very theoretically reasonable range of dark matter couplings. But I'm talking about producing dark matter in a laboratory and, and then what? It doesn't interact much. How are we going to see it? So, Believe it or not, there are actually already powerful constraints on dark matter production in the lab, and they come from the idea that any kind of proton or electron beam stopping in material will produce dark matter in its interactions. And we have very high intensity proton and electron beams that have been used for various, for various purposes. In the case of proton beams, we even have modern instrumented detectors downstream of their beam dumps namely the accelerator-based neutrino experiments. So one example is Minibone, and they did a dedicated run optimized to search for dark matter um, in, uh, I think, 2015 to 16, and put out a result on the archive a couple of months ago. So you produce dark matter in the dump. Just, that's a guaranteed reaction if you have these couplings, and it's kinematically accessible. 
And then that dark matter is boosted forward. So there is a beam of dark matter heading towards your detector. And now you can look for it scattering the detector. And even though the rate for production is small, and the rate for scattering off a different atom is small, you get to multiply those by two large numbers, the intensity of your beam, which is pretty large, typically around 10 to the 20 protons for these experiments, and the, uh, and the total number of nuclei in your detector, which is huge, like because these are ton scale, ton scale detectors. Um, so I think that's like 10 to the 26 times. And so even with these small interaction strengths, there are substantial constraints on dark matter interactions that are actually very close in sensitivity to these lines that I highlighted. It's motivated by thermal dark matter. So that's the good news. The bad news is that, well, you're still paying the small interaction strength penalty twice, which means that if you need to, if you want to reach a factor of 10 lower couplings, you need a 100 times more powerful beam or a 100 times bigger detector. And that scaling is pretty hard to achieve. So there's still progress to be made by you being enough experiments, but if you want to get to fully explore this parameter space, we need a different approach. And in particular, you need to find a way of looking for dark matter where you can actually detect an order one fraction of the dark matter production reaction. This is only possible if you're looking for dark matter production by looking at the kinematics of the physical part of the final state. So this has been done in both fixed target experiments and in collider experiments. And I want to show a little bit how they affect, how they reach this parameter state, just to sort of motivate what I'm going to focus on next. So the most powerful collider searches are at low energy, moderate energy colliders like the B factories, like Bavar and Bell 2 will improve on this. And they're limited by their luminosity. How many electron-positron pairs can they get to actually hit each other? That is going to set the signal rate, and that's roughly flat, depending on, irrespective of the mass of the dark matter. And it can be improved substantially by Bell 2. The alternative is to use fixed target collisions, and in that case, the cross sections actually get smaller at higher dark matter masses. So the production rate gets smaller at higher dark matter masses, which leads to a curved sensitivity. It roughly follows the same slope as these thermal production lines until you get up to high enough energies that there's a form factor suppression. And that's why it starts curling upwards at higher masses. So this is the kind of thing that actually scales the best to reach down to the thermal target, these thermal interaction milestones. In order to do it, you need to look at the interactions of about 10 to the 16 electrons. Now, 10 to the 16 electrons is not a big charge. It's around a millicoulomb. If you ask, how long does it take the LHC to run a millicoulomb through? It's about a millisecond. And this is not a lot of charge. It's, a ten, it's four orders of magnitude less than what was used in these beam dump experiments that I just showed you. But this is still a fairly tricky experiment to do. And so the, the, there was a similar approach demonstrated at low intensity at CERN. So there was a 10 to the 11 electron experiment called NA64 using high energy electrons. Um, but I, with a bunch of collaborators, asked the question, well, how do we, what does it take to scale this up? And suggested a basic approach with some changes to the overall experimental design back in 2014. And the LDMX collaboration, which is a joint institution collaboration involving SLAP and other labs and universities in the US and abroad, um, has been developing a, a detector concept. Um, the goal of which is to find few dark matter, to have sensitivity to the level of just a couple of dark matter events signal with 10 to the 15 electron interactions, or 10 to the 16 electrons. And so I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of what this entails, why it's hard, and also why it's doable. Um, I think 10 to the 15, 1 in 10 to the 15 sounds like a really daunting, almost crazy level of sensitivity. Um, so I will just remind you that the discovery of the Higgs in one channel, the ZZ channel, 
was precisely a few events in 10 to the 15 collisions. So, now, if you look at this plot, you don't see 10 to the 15, so the signal is in blue. There's background in red. You don't see 10 to the 15 background events there. You see, like, 100. That is after many, many layers of event selection that led to this plot. The total number of proton-proton collisions, so you can calculate from the luminosity, circled in that gray, and it's about 10 to the 15. So these are comparable levels of background rejection ambition to an OHC search. So where does it start? Well, I started by saying you need to detect the dark matter production kinematically. What that means is that if an electron produces dark matter and it's scattering off a nucleus, you aren't going to see the dark matter, and you won't really see the nucleus, because it doesn't, it's mostly just a stationary source of electromagnetic field. The only thing you can really hope to see is the recoil electron. So the kinematics of the recoil electron is the only thing that you can measure. You can measure its energy, and you can measure its angle, or the transverse component of its momentum. Those are the two physically interesting variables that you have access to. And so the first step of a search is the electron kinematics. And I've shown here a calculated distribution for a bunch of different dark matter masses of the uh, fraction of the beam energy carried by the recoil electron for dark matter production. Those are all the colored shaded histograms. Or for ordinary scattering of an electron in the standard model. That is the black histogram that's peaked at the electron still carrying most of the energy. So clearly, dark matter production has a very different energy spectrum than ordinary scattering. You can try to get a handle on that by looking, by measuring the momentum of an electron leaving the target, leaving the interaction zone with tracking. A silicon tracker is great for this. You also want to measure it before it hits the detector so that you know I don't just have a one jet electron coming out of my uh, coming out of my target because I happened to get a, one, a stray one jet electron coming in. That wouldn't be dark matter. That would just be beam contamination. You want to know that you had a full beam energy electron coming in, and then a small fraction of that energy leaving. So you need these two trackers, both of which can essentially be thought of at a very superficial level as taking a fraction of the heavy photon search tracker, basically cutting out a quarter of that and putting it into a new um, So this is a design for the HPF for the LDMX tracker that's been developed by the Slack and Santa Cruz groups. So, this is a useful signal, but it's not enough. And in particular, you can see that that low energy tail, no, it's, this is a long scale, that's visible. It's only at a level of, of a fractions of a percent. So there's events with a hard photon coming off of that incident electron at around the 10 to the minus 2 level. And we're looking for a 1 in 10 to the 16 signal. I'm using my mouse as over a point of session. We're looking for a 10 to the minus 16 level all the way at the bottom of the line. So clearly, this signal by itself is nowhere near enough. But these background events, the electron is losing energy. It's losing energy to something, typically photons or electron and positron pairs. And we can see those. So you can further filter events by measuring the total energy of the visible products that are coming out. If the electron scatters and produces dark matter that carries away most of the energy, the total energy that you'll detect in a downstream power limit is just the recoil electron's energy. That's much less than the beam energy. That's signal length. If the, dark, if the electron lost energy because it produced an energetic photon, then the total energy that you measure is the recoiling electron's energy plus the photon's energy because that photon typically will convert into an electron-positron pair, and that is comparable to the beam energy. So in fact, the idea for LDMX is to not even keep the data from events where the total energy is high. Those are just too high of a background rate. We will focus on only keeping, only storing the data from events where the total energy reconstruction and calorimeter is low. So before I get to the how does this help you with background rejection, let me just point out a few simple but unusual facts that this forces you into as far as the nature of the detector. And the, the big one, 
most accelerator-based detectors that you've seen have a hole for the beam to exit through. Here's Atlas, you can see a beam type of metal. On the right is class of experiments at Jepson Lab. They also have a beam pipe exiting the detector. They have a hole. Almost every fixed target detector has a hole. HPS, you couldn't see it because it was too tiny, but between those trackers, there's a little tiny hole for the beam to go through. LDMX cannot have a hole for the beam to exit. Because if we did, then you could lose all your energy through that hole. And there's no discrimination between that background and a signal on that. So you need to have a forward hermetic detector, something with no hole in the front. OK, well, I mean, at the level of drawing cartoons, that's not hard. That's easier. You just don't draw the hole. But at the level of actually making a detector that works, that's hard. Because it means that you have a lot of radiation. Every single beam electron is going to have a shower in that calorimeter. And the radiation dose from that is actually comparable to some of the highest radiation environments in the forward detectors of the LHC um, in, in the upgrades to higher luminosity. And so in fact, it motivates similar detector technology to that. So here on the left, you can see a prototype for the high granularity calorimeter. Uh, for one layer of the high granularity calorimeter at CMS. This is basically made of a bunch of hex hexagonal silicon board tessellated with one another to cover, a large, to cover a large region, and they've done test beam studies of how particles penetrate through a sequence of these boards with an absorbing material in between. So the general idea is that an electron goes through, deposits a little bit of energy in the silicon, and then in the absorbing material, it will radiate off a photon and then the softer or lower energy electron and the photon continue on their way. A photon will go through undetected in the silicon, but then the, in the absorber layer, it can convert into an electron-positron pair. Those deposit energy in the silicon, and so you just keep converting the energy from one high energy particle, be it an electron or a photon, to a whole shower of low energy particles, all going through the detector at the same time. And you can measure the energy of the initial particle from the energy deposited by all of those, all of those pieces in the shower. So the idea for LDMX is to use exactly the same kind of detector, exactly the same kind of active detector, same structure, with much smaller area, just seven, uh, seven hexagons tessellated together, um, and optimize the absorber thicknesses a little bit differently because we're looking at much higher, lower energy particles relative to the LHC. So the third thing that this force is on you, I want to measure the energy of each electron and all of the products, all of its final state products. If I have 100 electrons pitching on my detector at the same time in roughly the same place, I can't hope to do that very well. So you need to drip the electrons into the experiment just a few at a time in order to measure them individually. One at a time, or if you can spread them out spatially, you can do a few at a time. And if you then do the math, okay, I want to reach 10 to the 16 electrons in a reasonable you know, few year experiment so that a grad student can eventually write a thesis on it, this, you need something like a 40 megahertz beam or higher. Now, 40 megahertz is a convenient number because that's the repetition rate of the LHC. So detectors designed for the LHC pretty much are going to work at 25, at a 40 megahertz beam rate. Um, prospects to realize this kind of beam structure, there aren't that many around the world. In fact, right now, the only, well, right now there are no such beams being used for particle physics. There are prospects to use a transfer line off of LCLS2 to realize this at Slack. There is an existing beam like this, primarily used for nuclear physics at JLab. And there's an idea to use slow extraction of an electron beam from the SPS to realize this at CERN. So it's definitely doable, but this is not an off-the-shelf accelerator. OK, so those are the basic sort of big picture steps you had to take when you think about trying to measure total energy. What does it get you? Well, it pretty much lets you reject all of these hard photon backgrounds, pair of electron backgrounds. But not quite, because I was relying on the hard photons starting an electromagnetic shower in the color. That was, that was the whole premise of this study. A small fraction of the time, 
an a photon won't convert into an electron positron pair because instead it slams into a nucleus and just liberates a bunch of pions and neutrons and protons. Complicated nuclear final state. And these tend to, pop, to deposit much less energy. So down at the 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6 level, you have these photon conversion to hadrons, photon conversion to muons type of events where even though you thought you could reject your photon, it's actually not producing the signal you expect. This is something that a collider physicist would generally call an instrumental background because the primary reaction that, the, that I'm concerned with here is one that you should be able to veto. It's just that it does the wrong thing in the detector. But unlike the LHC, where we just parametrize away our instrumental backgrounds and you know, live with them and float them, we really need to understand what they are and how well we can reject them. So all, of course, this is where universality comes into play. All of the physics inside of the calorimeter is actually physics we understand. And we can predict the rates for these interactions through which energy is lost. Okay. They're lost through specific photonuclear reactions. And most of those are not hopeless to detect. Most of them, for example, if you produce a muon, if you produce one or two muons with reasonable energy, they're going to leave a track going through most or all of the detector. If you produce a shower of pions, neutrons, protons, you might not see discernible tracks, but you will see a sort of puffing out of the electromagnetic shower to larger radii than you would have expected. And so because our calorimeter has detailed information about the shower, it's really taking an image of the interactions of those particles, we can look for these features, we can quantify them, and put them into a boosted decision tree to try to distinguish, to try to tell, do we have a dark matter event, or do we have one of these rare photon interaction events? And this works really well. This can, in simulation, lower the background rates by four to five orders of magnitude relative to just energy, uh, just an energy requirement, with a, uh, with a really good, like, 80% signal efficiency. It works well, but there is a failure mode that, again, you can predict just by thinking about it, which is that if the photon's reaction only made neutrons, they really don't interact enough in the calorimeter to be seen. You just need more material in order to get a neutron interaction. And so that's sort of the last ingredient of the detector. It is a much larger detector in which the neutrons should interact. And it needs to be sensitive, it needs to be well instrumented. It needs to be. But it can be a lot slower than this front electromagnetic calorimeter. It can be less granular because most of the messy stuff from most of the interactions gets trapped in this front silicon calorimeter. So you can do a much coarser study in the hadron detail. Now, we still need the veto to do a lot of work. There was about five orders of magnitude left of rejection that's needed for one and two neutron events. So one neutron events are the ones that are the hardest to veto. Typically, you don't just get one neutron out of a photon collision, but you might get one neutron and some really soft other thing that's so low energy that you can't really see it. You have basically one shot to detect that neutron. So you better have enough material that the probability of that neutron not interacting in your detector is 10 to the minus 5. And that tells you you need about a 3 meter deep calorimeter. Two neutron events, naively, and most of their phase space are easier. You get two shots to detect the neutron. So if you can reject two neutron events, one neutron events at 10 to the minus 5, you can reject two neutron events at 10 to the minus 10. But two neutron events can have momentum cancellation between one neutron going to the left and the other neutron going to the right. And so you need to make your detector wide enough that they both pass through enough material. So basically, these two rare types of events are controlling the depth you need for the detector and the width you need for the detector to veto one and two neutron events, respectively. Now, this turns out to be a rather subtle question, figuring out how large a detector do you need in order to get the needed neutron background rejection. 
And the reason is that getting an accurate model of the single and dineutron rate turns out to be fairly subtle. And so, so Monte Carlo tools are used all the time in particle physics to predict different kinds of event rates for both signal and background. We can do that here too. But the relevant Monte Carlo tools for this kind of interaction, in particular for simulating the secondary interactions of particles, are things like JAMP 4 toolkit. This was really designed to study bulk, bulk propagation, propagation to model things like detector resolutions. So if you want to quantify a resolution, you want to see what the sort of 10 to the minus 2 level interaction rates are, and then fit a Gaussian to it. Um, we're talking about studying a 10 to the minus 7 level photon reaction. And perhaps not surprisingly, this is stretching the applicability of JAM4 a little bit. Um, so fortunately, we don't rely only on JAM4. The relevant processes here are really driven by photon-proton or photon-neutron processes, giving rise to a two-particle final state. And these have all been measured over a wide range of particle energies with their full kinematics quite reliably. In many cases, dating back to the 70s. Um, in other cases, these are sort of early 2000s measurements. Um, and in a couple of, there's a couple of relevant processes that were just measured at Jeff Jefferson Lab in this decade. Um, but so we can draw on these direct cross-section measurements to figure out what the scale of the rate should be for photon-proton or photon-neutron interactions. Now, where JAMT excels is if you want to understand what, how does that translate into a rate of different processes in a heavy nucleus. You have to model not just, oh, I produced a neutron, but does that neutron interact, kick off another neutron as it's leaving the nucleus, does it kick off a pion, things like that. And so JAMP4 does a really good job of modeling that intranuclear physics. And that actually dominates the two neutron rates, so it's crucial to get it right. You can't just leave it out and scale up our single proton data by the number of protons in a nucleus. So combining both approaches, we've been able to get a really good picture of what these single and dineutron rates should be. Um, with some interesting twists along the way, some of the processes leading to two neutron events, for example, we found were overestimated by a factor of 1,000 in the default J-4 code. There were other important processes that turned out to dominate the single neutron production that were actually left out. And so we needed to go in and address all of these issues and fix, fix them in the code. Um, and that's an ongoing process. And then there's been a much more basic computational challenge that we're really trying to figure out for the first time, how do you use this framework designed for inclusive simulations to study rare exclusive processes? Okay, so you put all this together, figure out how big a detector you need. It's about a three meter deep detector. And this lets you get your photon-induced background down to about the one electron level. A byproduct is that the electron-induced processes go down to a significantly sub-event sub -event level in terms of the 16 electrons. And the reason all of the electron-induced processes are easier to reject than the photon-induced processes is that they're basically the same processes except with a virtual photon in a Feynman diagram instead of a real photon. And the virtual photon rate is factor of 10 inch smaller. There's also weak interaction processes that can give you neutrinos. That would be a really troubling, irreducible background, except that it's at like the 0.01 of that level. So it's really not an issue for these guys. Okay, so I think there's, there's a solid basis to expect that this kind of experiment can achieve a sub event background level. But an experiment like this has never been done before. NA64 had four orders of magnitude fewer electrons on target and wasn't even trying to use a separate target tracker than calorimeter. It was just running much higher energy electrons into the calorimeter. So it's been built into the LDMX from the beginning that it should be more than a counting experiment. We really need additional handles so that if we see 10 events, we won't be left wondering is this dark matter, or did we underestimate some nuclear physics rate by a factor of 10? Did we overestimate our veto efficiency by a factor of 10? You need more. You need another discriminating feature to look at those 10 events and say, have I found dark matter, or have I found a problem with my experiment um, that, I, that I need to redesign? And not have to wait for the bigger, better experiment five years later to be constructed. 
and tell us the answer. Uh, so the key trend, the final measurement, I alluded to this briefly earlier, is to look at the momentum of that electron perpendicular to the beam direction. When dark matter is produced, it gives that electron a sizable kick, roughly scaling as the dark matter mass. And so you can see in all these solid lines the kind of distribution of transverse momentum that you expect so on the left. Um, and the two shaded regions show the transverse momentum distribution for background. And those transverse momentum distributions are really very much the same before and after the instrumental vetoes. So they're also very simple to understand, especially the blue peak, which is extremely simple to understand as a calculate. And we can just look at it. So this is very analogous to the final distribution in the Higgs search, being looking at the mass of the two particles to see a peak. Unfortunately, we don't get access to a peak for LDMX, but there's a shape that's very distinctive and different between dark matter and ordinary physics. So this gives you unique potential to reach all of the milestones for thermal dark matter at masses below about 100 MeV, with complementary sensitivity at high masses from Bell 2. And I think that the thing that's most exciting, though, about this program is actually not just the discovery potential, but how quickly one can go from a discovery to really doing precision physics of the dark matter sector. This is especially true if you have multiple kinds of experiments in this program. So for example, between a missing momentum, either a missing momentum experiment or a beam dump experiment, actually, with enough statistics, can start telling you from angular distributions, kinematic distributions about the dark matter mass and the force carrier mass. When you combine the two, you also gain access to the separate charges how strongly does this new interaction couple to ordinary matter? How strongly does it couple to dark matter? If you combine that with a direct detection experiment, well, first of all, you confirm that there's a particle you're producing that's actually cosmologically long-lived. You can measure its abundance by comparing the signal rate in direct detection to the signal rate in accelerators, something we still haven't managed to do for neutrinos, but could be much easier in this case. You measure the spin, and can by comparing all of these quantities, can now test whether the particle physics properties are actually compatible with the thermal origin or not. So there's a really rich science program of understanding the microphysics of dark matter if this scenario is realized. And one can also search for a wealth of signals beyond dark matter. Um, new physics weakly coupled to us, for example, molecular charged particles, new lobular force carriers that came back to ordinary matter or to neutrinos are all very reasonable possibilities, even if they have nothing to do with dark matter, and they're possibilities that are ripe for exploration by LDMX and related small experiments. So I will skip the summary of points in my conclusions and just come back to Vera Rubin. The world is more mysterious and more complex than we had imagined, and still more mysteries of the universe remain hidden, but she ends on an optimistic note. The discovery awaits the adventurous scientists of the future and I think we are now at a point where for many different dark matter possibilities, including this one, we're ready to begin that adventure to see what most of the universe is made. Well, thank you very much, Natalia, for a very clear and interesting and exciting talk. Um, let's ask if there are questions. Or anybody got already found dark matter? So, in your limit talk, uh So, is is that assuming essentially just a counting experiment, or is it? Are those using the missing momentum distribution? So, this is for counting experiment. If you use the distribution, like let's say you had some say order 10 background events, then you would need to use the distribution and it would flatten out just from the low mass region. It really doesn't affect, because the, the higher mass sensitivity is at much higher transverse momentum, so you could basically apply a transverse momentum cut to kill the dark matter, keep a high signal efficiency, so it just flattens out the bottom of the curve a little bit if you do have background. Yeah, Natalia, Okay, so, I mean, this gets into the problem with using words like Big Bang. 
Um, when I use, which is a little bit vague, when I use Big Bang, I mean the thermal part of the universe's history, um, where it was really hot. And there's good indirect but strong evidence that prior to that thermal part of the universe's history, there was an era of inflation, where the universe was just expanding exponentially, um, relatively cold, boring, just driven by vacuum energy. Um, and there could be, there are models, for example, axion models of dark matter frequently have a, a, an abundance, at least in some, for some parameter ranges, that is dominated by production during, during that inflationary era. So it's not before the beginning of time, which is what be, before the Big Bang perhaps suggests to colloquially. But it's before the, it's pre thermal. All, all the constraints uh, from Big Bang nuclear synthesis. Yeah, so depending on how you, uh, so there's some model dependent constraints. Um, one of the best constraints comes from comparing the effective number of relativistic species during PBN and the cosmic migrant background measurements. And how you interpret those really depends on, you know, what other statements you want, what, what other particle content you allow in the theory beyond the, uh, beyond the dark matter itself and the standard model. So if you allow for the possibility that the new sector that contains dark matter could also contain some additional radiation-like degrees of freedom, then depending on the, uh, well, then the sort of standard way of doing the statistics tells you that the dark matter is probably lighter than about two to four MeV. So it's sort of, I don't know, a sixth of the way across this plot. Um, but I think there's some, uh, at least, at least my, my feeling is that the statistical confidence underlying that is, you know, questionable. Um, so I would not be, I would not be flabbergasted if we found dark matter at one and a half MeV. But it would be in tension with the uh, CME. Okay. Is there an instruction in the building? No, it is uh, it's in the passing the hat around the face. <laughs> How can citizens help? Um, <laughs> depends, on the the, depends on the wealth of the citizen. <laughs> we'll have a silver collection after the uh, yeah, paper. So, yeah. Bye. So this assumes, that's a good question. This assumes one, one energy. Um, you get a distribution of recoil energies for any given uh, beam energy. The beam energy ha has to be high enough, otherwise the experiment becomes terribly difficult. Um, so the lowest energy beam that we're thinking about, which is the hardest one, is a 4 GeV beam. Um, and as you go up to 10, 12 GeV, these neutron background rates actually go down significantly. And so that's helpful. But you don't you don't need to scan the main energy. Oh. Yeah, how, there are a lot of details that I'm not following. I have to admit it. I'm sorry. But here's the question: How does it work backwards? In other words, you're looking for a class of dark matter candidates, and suppose you build this machine, and it comes out no. What have you falsified? So you falsified the idea of roughly subproton mass dark matter that was produced thermally through its interactions that, that was whose whose rate whose whose interaction strength is responsible for thermal production. Okay, so only that very limited subproton. Right. Now you can combine, by the way, I mean going up to like 10 GeV, there's other accelerating constraints. And then the WIMP constraints start kicking in. But there's there's weaselly outs that are actually theoretically reasonable, um, where you could have undetectable whips. Um, so I don't completely know how to roll those out. Um, they, uh, I mean, I say they're weaselly because it's things like you rely on a you can rely on a on a, a, a destructive interference between Higgs induced scattering and a loop of Ws, and that just sounds contrived. But if you just 
ask, what do you expect for a triplet, SU2 triplet dark matter with a Higgs at 126 GeV? They cancel pretty well. <laughs> so. Okay, well, so, um, good question and answer session, and thank you again very much, Natalia, for an excellent talk. Good luck. <laughs> yes, good luck. Uh, hope you. Uh, Able to uh, mount an experiment. Yeah, and I appreciate the because I have to give the Ockham lecture a function. And so I shall. Uh...